Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for tuning in to Vastola on the Law. Sharina, let me know if we're having some technical difficulties. That introduction sounded Goodbye. a little funny. So uh, I am Jeff Vastola, your host. I'm here every Saturday morning to give you free legal advice. And all you have to do is sit back and listen to enjoy it. Or if you'd like to be interactive with me, you can call into the show. You just heard the number. It's 877-850-8585. Or if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can type in a question. And then I will do my best to watch it and see it and catch it and respond to it as quickly as I can. If I miss your question on Facebook Live, I do typically watch the show afterwards. And I will respond to you when I can. And... Safety measures, if I don't respond to you, call me on my cell phone to let me know. Say, hey Jeff, I reached out to you during the show, haven't heard from you, what are your thoughts on this? And, and I'll be happy to have that conversation with you. My toll-free number that forwards to my cell phone 24-7 is 833-VASTOLA. That's 833-827-8652. I know I'm throwing a lot of phone numbers at you, but just uh, write them all down. And that way you'll have them at your, at your ready disposal. Again, the toll-free number to my cell phone that you can use anytime other than Saturday morning from 7.30 to 8, because I won't answer the phone at that time, is 833-827-8652. 833-VASTOLA, that's all you need to remember. Hey, if you didn't know, uh, we just opened up a new office location down in the Keys. If you've been injured in the Keys, check out our new website, injuredinthekeys.com. Uh, that actually forwards to my existing website, but uh, I thought that the website name was catchy, and so I went ahead and obtained that domain, and it's up and running and live. And uh, so good morning. I've got uh, my mom this morning watching. I've got my beautiful wife this morning watching. Good morning to both of you, my ever-present support. Uh, let me see. We've got a lot of things going on. Not only are we opening up a new office location down in the Keys, but we have our first ever Vastola free legal seminar and there's my sister Lee good morning Lee so if you are not aware of what we're doing on April 27th I have rented a hotel seminar room and it's all free to the public so it's called the Vastola free legal seminar uh, we are going to be presenting topics uh, speakers I'm going to be doing a raffle giveaway I'm going to be, and part of that raffle giveaway is going to be a uh, set of tires, presumably to somebody that is in need. Um, I don't like to see people driving around on bald tires. It's just kind of a personal issue of my own. So all of this is going to go Don't down. Go, on, right? Oh, okay. April 27th at the Embassy Suites Hotel in Palm Beach Gardens. It is free from 1 to 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Let's talk to Don from Delray. Good morning, Don. How are you? morning, Jeff. So, Don, what's can happening? You hear me? I can hear you just fine. What's your question today? <clears throat> hey, I'd be happy to go to your seminar on April 27th. Hope to see uh, you. And uh, providing I, I should have the car by then. Would you let me have the address? It's the Embassy Suites Hotel in Palm Beach Gardens. I don't know the physical address, but it's right off of I-95 on PGA Boulevard. You can't miss it. Okay, what's your name in the motel again? It's a hotel. It's Embassy Suites. I, I won't be doing my free legal seminar okay. at a motel. I promise you that. Okay. Uh, my question is that I was just uh, interested to know uh, what constitutes the uh, ju uh, um, on the uh, judgment where a person is uh, judgment proof. Well, judgment proof is really more of a term of art than anything. It's not. A, it's not a specific definition, but. Judgment proof refers to somebody who doesn't have any assets or probably more appropriately does have assets but has put them into different vehicles, if you will, or have placed them into different areas where a creditor, somebody who has sued that person, has gone to trial, has obtained a judgment, will not be able to collect those assets. That's generally what judgment proof means. So you hear it all the time in my line of work where uh, physicians are oftentimes considered to be judgment proof if they have taken steps to secure all of their assets. They can utilize uh, trusts to protect assets. They can uh, put everything in the name 
of the spouse, assuming that the spouse is not, you know, also a practicing physician in the same group, which sometimes happens. Uh, so th that's generally speaking done what the term means. Uh, did that answer your question or did you have follow up? Well, I have a little follow up. I'm saying if, this, if uh, someone is on a very low Social Security and has no funds, no assets, no vehicle, no home, and can the, uh, can the Social Security be attacked if a person gets a judgment against them? No. Or is it just uh, the IRS is the only one that can attach it? Well, that's a good point. The IRS certainly can, I believe, but no, most judgment creditors are not allowed to touch uh, secured income benefits, such as Social Security uh, pension benefits, even though that's not necessarily governmental. Uh, pension benefits are protected. In Florida, if you weren't already aware, a lot of people refer to Florida as a debtor's haven. And the reason why Florida is called a debtor's haven is because it has so many laws on the books to protect people that owe money. So uh, to answer your question, Don, yes, people that are on fixed income, uh, people that have no assets, uh, they are typically considered to be judgment proof. Now, understand the term judgment proof doesn't mean that they can't have a judgment against them. If you're sued, you go to trial and you lose as the defendant, the court will enter a judgment against you. And once the judgment's entered, it does a lot of things automatically. Uh, it can attach to real estate. Once it's filed, it will attach to, to real estate. And oftentimes a judgment creditor cannot foreclose real estate, but that judgment being recorded will act as a lien on real estate. So if you are a judgment debtor, meaning you owe somebody money, they have filed the judgment and it's acting as a lien on your real estate, if you were to try to sell your real estate, you wouldn't be able to sell it without satisfying the lien because the lien is going to be a cloud on the title. So again, judgment proof means a lot of things to a lot of different people. It doesn't mean that you can't have a judgment against you. Um, judgment proof could mean you have a judgment against you. There's a lien against your real estate, but they can't foreclose on it. Now, this is tangential, but understand that there are some judgment creditors, depending on the reason why you were sued, that can foreclose your home. So don't just automatically assume from this brief conversation that your home is always protected. Uh, and then this is assuming that you have homestead protection on your home. Um, there are some limited reasons why the judgment creditor can actually foreclose the home and force a sale and basically kick you out. So there's, there's a lot to it. Simple question, long answer. Um, anything else, Don? Just one other thing. Can the play, if the plaintiff loses when he sues somebody, can the defendant's attorney uh, turn around and sue the plaintiff for uh, payment? Yes, uh, in, in, in several different ways. First of all, the law in Florida, when it comes to litigation, is that the loser pays. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean the loser pays every penny. It means that the costs, not attorney's fees, but the costs associated with the defense of the action are going to be borne by the losing party. That applies to either the plaintiff or the defendant, depending on who actually loses. And understand, there could be a question of who is the winner and who is the loser. If you file a lawsuit that has two different counts and you win on one count and you lose on another count, who's the winner? Who's the loser? These are things that the courts are, are faced with all the time. But uh, it's an interesting question. And uh, Don, this was not a planted question at all. I just want the, uh, the listening audience to understand that. But I was reading through my Florida Law Weekly this morning, and one of the cases that I have earmarked is a case on what's called a proposal for settlement. It's highlighted right down there. The proposal for settlement is a tool that either party can use during the litigation to up the stakes so that if one side or the other loses the case, then perhaps not only will the losing party be responsible for just the costs, but will now be responsible for the attorney's fees that are incurred by the other side. Um, so proposal for settlement is one way that the parties can up the risks um, and, and make settlement a little bit more attractive, whereas before maybe it wasn't all that attractive. Uh, it's also called an offer of judgment. Proposal for settlement, offer of judgment, it's the same thing, it just depends on where you're reading. Secondly, keep in mind that oftentimes contracts 
have language in them that says the prevailing party is going to be entitled to attorney's fees. Those provisions are enforceable in Florida. And even if it's written only one way, you'll see these things in uh, landlord-tenant contracts where the lease agreement is written by the landlord. It says landlord is entitled to attorney's fees only. Well, the courts construe that to be what's called a mutual provision. So it's the prevailing party that's going to be entitled to attorney's fees. So if you're a landlord and if you, if you think the way your contract is written is only going to benefit you, think again, that's a mutual provision. It's going to be uh, to the benefit of the prevailing party, whoever that is. So thank you, Don. Listen, I'm going to get to some of my topics. Thanks for calling. And if you have any follow-up, let me know, okay? Mark from Boca. Oh, great. All right, let's go to Mark from Boca. I always give priority to people that are calling into the show. So if my topics go on hold, so be it. Mark, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Jeff. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. My question is, I'm filling out some papers for my 89-year-old mother who adopted my brother's son when my brother passed away. Okay, hang on a second. Um, 89-year-old mother, adopted son brother's son. My mother adopted by okay, a so, motorcycle accident two years ago. Hey, hey Mark? She, my, my mom, yes. We're talking over each other. I'm going to ask Hello? you to repeat that last part. I understand that your mother adopted your brother's son, but what did you say after that about a motorcycle accident? My, my, my brother, when she adopted, my brother passed away, my mother adopted his son. My, my nephew died in a motorcycle accident two years ago. Okay. My mother was living with my daughter, who now refuses that when my mother left to give her his ashes. So I'm trying to fill out the paperwork for her, but when I fill out the paperwork at the courthouse before I hand it in, it, how do I put a, a value on somebody's ashes? Well, I'm a bit I, I confused. I I'm a bit. I fill that out. I, yeah. I know that may, go ahead. Well, I'm a bit confused about the family tree, but I think we can set that aside for, for a moment because my... My okay. bigger confusion and the most important aspect of all of this is what paperwork are you filling out? What is it that you are trying to achieve with somebody's ashes? I'm trying to get my mother to give, to give, my, to give my daughter by, by legal means to give the, my, my nephew's ashes back to my mother, who is legally his guardian or was. And why is your daughter maintaining the ashes and not giving it to your mother? We don't know just refusing to give him back maybe something, you know, mental. I, I, I don't know what the situation is. I can't get an answer. W what is the I'm relationship? It, so. What's the relationship with your daughter to the decedent? Why, why do you think that she's holding on to these ashes? Well, my mother and her relationship are strained. We've all been strained since his death. My nephew was with them at the time of the, uh, the, the accident on the motorcycle. My mother blames them, and there hasn't been any communication since then. And when she was living with my daughter, after my father passed away, now that she's back on her own, my daughter's refusing to give her back my nephew's ashes. All right. So your daughter... What legal means... What legal means are there to get them back? My daughter yeah. is not really a any kind of relative to her, but a I, I, I mean a distant relative. She's my daughter, but my mother was my nephew's adopted mother. Yeah. So I'm gleaning from this conversation, Mark. Yeah, I'm gleaning from this conversation that your daughter has no rights to the ashes. She just won't give them up. Yes. All right. Well, here's here's the quick answer to your question. The quick answer is I have no idea. This is a this is a question that I'm going to have to research and get back to you with a with what I consider to be an educated response. So what I'm going to do, Mark, is I'm going to take my notes and I'm going to make this my topic for next week's show. And what you need to do is either be listening to next week's show or if you miss it, you'll be able to find it in, in either one of the libraries, either on my website or on the radio show's website. And um, I'll do my best to be able to answer your question. There is a Florida statute on the remains of a decedent. I can't quote you the statute right now, and I can't tell you what it's going to say about ashes, but I will do my best to get you a good answer, okay? I appreciate it. 
appreciate it, and I, I listen to you every week. So I will be definitely, uh, I'll have my ears open. All right. Well, and if there's follow-up next week, uh, feel free you, to yeah. call in again, okay? I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Because I can't get an answer myself. Yeah, all right. Well, um, I'm sorry that this is happening, but we'll get to the bottom of it. All right. Thank so, you, Jeff. I appreciate your time. No problem. Okay. So uh, topics for me today, um, I was going to be talking about um, what happens when medical records are lost. Um, it, uh, as you all know, if you listen to my show, my topics are created either by a person calling in with a question and I don't know the answer and so I have to do the research, or if I don't have a situation like that, what's happened to me during my work week where I feel as though it's an interesting topic. And this week I had a lengthy conversation with an individual where the issue uh, revolves around medical records were lost. It was no fault of his. And, you know, what are the consequences of that? Well, the uh, seminal case in Florida on the loss of medical records is a Florida Supreme Court case called Valson. It's um, Gregoria Valson, that's spelled D as in Victor, A-L-C-I-N, versus Public Health Trust of Dade County. This is a situation where a woman... Um, and her husband had sued doctors in the Jackson Memorial Hospital for um, complications from an ectopic pregnancy, uh, so on and so forth. Ectopic pregnancy, if you are not already aware, is where a uh, fetus embeds in a fallopian tube, not the uterus. It's never a viable pregnancy. The, the issue always in those types of cases is did they do the right things to uh, resolve you know, the pregnancy and save the mom? So... In this particular case, the, the operative report went missing. And the trial court at the trial level in the Val Sin case said, well, because um, the medical records are not available, it certainly wasn't the plaintiff's fault. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a hearing to determine whether or not uh, the medical records were lost negligently, meaning it was just a mistake, or perhaps if they were lost intentionally, because if it was intentional, obviously the consequences are gonna be much more severe. So that decision was appealed and was ultimately uh, determined by the Florida Supreme Court to say, well, we think that the trial court was, was he headed in the right direction, but ultimately their, their opinion was too sweeping with regard to the consequences of intentional actions. Ultimately, the Florida Supreme Court's opinion, which is the law of the land in Florida, says that if a medical provider loses records, then there can be uh, a negative consequence. There can be what's called a negative rebuttable presumption that's read to a jury to say the absence of records indicates that um, there was negligence on the part of the medical provider. So ordinarily where a plaintiff has a burden of proof and has to be able to prove every element of the case, if you have records that go missing, the plaintiff doesn't have to prove that anymore. Now, it's a rebuttable presumption because the defense is given the opportunity to explain it and perhaps, you know, plead with the jury to say, please don't penalize us because this is our explanation. But nevertheless, that Valsin instruction, uh, the name of the case oftentimes becomes the name of the, of the doctrine. And so now you've got this Valsin doctrine in the state of Florida that applies to the loss of medical records. And then on a, on a broader spectrum, the loss of medical records is considered to be the loss of evidence. And uh, the loss of evidence generally is called spoliation. And I'm gonna spell it because a lot of people get it wrong. It's S-P-O-L-I-A-T-I-O-N, spoliation. A lot of people think, and, and I did, certainly when I was in law school and the first time I ever saw this, I thought it was a typo. And I thought, well, certainly they meant spoliation because it makes sense. To spoil something is to lose it or you know it goes bad or whatever. Uh, the word is actually spoliation and it is the loss or destruction of evidence. And so spoliation is more broad in that it doesn't have to do with just medical records, it has to do with all kinds of evidence. And um, again, a topic that came up in my work week because I um, signed up a new client for a car accident. The issue was you know black box information and so we immediately had to send out letters to the insurance companies for both vehicles saying, do not lose, destroy, alter, um, delete whatsoever any of the information contained within what's called the electronic data recording. The EDR is the acronym for what most people call a black box. Uh, 
Uh, most vehicles that have been produced, I don't know, I'm going to take a stab and say maybe since 2010 and possibly earlier, all have black boxes in them. You may not even be aware of it. And what they do is really remarkable, all of the information that they capture. They're constantly running. And what happens is if there's an accident, or it doesn't have to be an accident, it can be an event. Um, and there's not just one black box. Oftentimes vehicles have more than one black box and they're attached to different instrumentation in the vehicle. The most common is the black box that's attached to your uh, airbags. Uh, airbags, uh, obviously when they're deployed, it's a triggering event. And what happens is after a triggering event, no matter what it may be, the electronic data recorder stamps its memory with what happened in the five seconds prior. And so I'm actually using EDR data in another case of mine, which was a head-on collision. Uh, there were you know, two fatalities in the crash. And this EDR data is proving to be incredibly interesting. So um, in the event that you're involved in any kind of a, a car accident or other uh, issue where you may have EDR data, which is black box data, make sure that you ask for it. Make sure that you uh, ask that it be preserved, not deleted, not amended. And the download is oftentimes pretty tricky because sometimes if you do one download, that's all you get. You can download it one time. So it's important to request that the download be done at a mutually convenient time for everybody to be there so that you can have your own experts there. Now, um, I would suggest that oftentimes the, the information would be shared if it had been previously downloaded, but uh, you, you just never know. So. I was going to talk about the Valsen instruction today, which I did. If you have any questions about that, uh, by the way, if you want to call into the show the way Don and Mark did, you can call 877-850-8585. That's the number to call into 850 AM, where this show is broadcast every Saturday morning from 8, oh, from 730 to 8. And then, of course, Facebook Live is running at the same time, and you can watch the Facebook Live whenever you want. But... If you would like to reach me 24-7 because you have a case that you want to talk to me about, please use 833-VASTOLA. That's the number that goes to my cell phone. And I have my cell phone typically pretty close to me. If I don't answer the phone, please leave me a voicemail message and I will do my best to get back to you. I have heard in the recent past that the voicemail fills up. If you get a message to say that my voicemail is full, don't text that number. Because what I've found out in the past couple of weeks is that text messages that are going to 833-VASTOLA don't go through. Uh, so what you can do is you can uh, call again because I do go through my voicemail and delete them. So I'm just saying there, there are ways to reach me. Good morning, Delita. Nice to see you. Um, and Delita working at Matrix, I assume, still working at Matrix Mediation. There's a plug for you. You can tell Rodney. Um, so let me see, our free legal seminar, I wanted to talk a little bit more about that because it's a big event, for me anyway, and I wanted to make sure that everybody's aware of it. It's April 27th, it's gonna be from one to four, and it's free, it's free, it's free, it's free, it's free. Uh, you just come get all the information that we're there to present to you. Uh, there's gonna be uh, food and drink, and uh, hi Delita, <laughs> I'm, I have to get closer to read it, so. Uh, yeah, please tell Rodney that I gave him a uh, shameless plug. But um, we are going to be giving presentation on insurance. As most of you know, if you watch my program or if you listen to my program, insurance is a big deal with me because I like to make sure that people understand why it's there, how you can use it to protect yourself. My conversation with Don this morning on being judgment-proof. One way you can protect yourself from a judgment is by having adequate insurance coverage. That's one of the reasons it's there, maybe the main reason that it's there. So we're gonna be talking a lot about insurance. I have a, um, I, I've got a health professional that's gonna be coming. Uh, it's not necessarily legal related, but there is a bit of a legal tie-in because if you're in an accident or any kind of an event where you're injured, it really, really, really is important that you get the appropriate medical treatment. You can go anywhere to get medical treatment, but what's important is that you get appropriate medical treatment because if you're not addressing the right symptom, which is the symptom is being caused by a specific ailment, and if you're not addressing the right symptom, which is not addressing the right ailment, then you could be getting medical treatment that's just not going to help you. And so whenever you're involved in any kind of an event where you're hurt, your primary motivation really ought to be to get the best physical recovery that you can get. 
And, and honestly, when I sign up a new client, I always tell them, that's my main purpose, is to help you get the best, not financial recovery, that will come. I'm gonna help you get the best physical recovery you can by making sure that the treatment is appropriate. Now, I'm not a doctor, I don't pretend to be a doctor, but I've been doing this long enough to know that if you've got neurological symptoms, but you're only getting orthopedic type treatment, then that's, it's not necessarily a problem, but you're not getting what you need. Um, so, you know, the old saying, you don't go to a foot doctor for a, for a heart problem. You know, you, you have to make sure that you're going to the right type of provider. So anyway, that's going to be a part of the seminar is a health topic. And as, as I mentioned, there's going to be a raffle giveaway and uh, hopefully it's just going to, it's going to help you. You're going to come on and you're going to leave with more than what you came in with. But it's our first ever Vastola free legal seminar, April 27th. Spread the word. One Embassy minute. Suites. I'm sorry, Shreya? One minute. One minute, okay. Spread the word. Embassy Suites, April 27th. It's the Embassy Suites off of PGA Boulevard in Palm Beach Gardens. I want to thank everybody for listening and watching and calling in today. I am Jeff Vastola. If you ever want to talk to me about a case, call 833-VASTOLA. And remember that we have an office down in the Keys now. So we have an office in Gardens, an office in Stewart, and an office down in the Keys. 30 seconds. And um, I hope everybody has a fantastic weekend. Sharina, thank you so much for all of your help, all that you do for me every Saturday morning. I really appreciate you. And uh, God bless. Have a great weekend.